Hello and what's up to you all, Mindsetters, awesome Mindsetters. It is me, Abram. On a lovely Monday, it is our Triple M day. We call it our Mindsetters Mat Monday. I hope you enjoyed your day at school and you're going to tell me more about it as we go on with the show. Natasha, how are you? I'm very well, thanks, AB. Good to see you and uh, good to see that you're being all cool with your <laughs> cap all to the side. <laughs> thanks. How was your weekend though? It was good, good. And yours? Awesome. Mine was great too. Busy, but well... <laughs> I hope the mindset has also enjoyed. Well, uh, we've got a lot of things happening today, but what are they doing, um, Natasha? What are we doing, actually? Okay, so we're carrying on with functions, grade 10s. We've been looking at functions for the last two weeks, and today we're sort of wrapping up with functions by looking at trigonometric functions. So that's what we're looking at in today's so lesson. So it's like a closure today. like Well, not a closure. It's the final section in functions, which is trigonometric functions. It's the only section that we haven't tackled when uh, when doing functions, so it's just our last part of that section. Okay, so if mindset is you have questions, feel free to throw them. I'm on facebook.com forward slash Extra. Like the page, share the page with everybody, tell them to come in and join us and walk together with us. Also on Twitter, on Twitter you can follow us at Extra. And the third thing is we've got notes for you guys. They're all for free in two options, the viewing option and the download option. They'll be found on Facebook, but should you not see them on Facebook, but they are on Facebook, you can go to learn.mindset.co.za and always get them in advance. Otherwise, on the notes, we also post a test yourself link to a question or a list of questions whereby if you answer them correctly, all of them, you stand a chance of winning this awesome Casio calculator proudly sponsored by Casio. The winner of last week's show will be announced later on. Another thing, we have a Mo or Maths application whereby if you go to momaths.org and you use the, the code which is 2FB5, great tens, it's 2FB for Facebook, 5, that is your code. You can also enter into a challenge and see if you can answer some of the questions on functions, test yourself and if you're struggling um, get some help from us because we are here for you otherwise back to you Natasha all right guys so today as I said we're going to be looking at trigonometric functions sort of doing our last part of functions I'm sure we'll come back to it when we do revision but here we're just looking at the final section which we haven't tackled yet and that's trig graphs specifically in today's lesson we're going to draw some sketch graphs of trigonometric functions on a given domain and we're also going to look at trigonometric graph interpretation. Guys, I just want to remind you when we say sketch graphs, this is not plot point by point plotting. So you're not using a table of values and plotting point by point by point. It's a sketch graph. So we're using the key points to get an idea of what the graph would look like. All right. Then just a reminder of your challenge question for today. You've got a diagram that's given, and it's, draw it's showing the graphs of f of theta is equal to 3 sine theta, and g of theta is equal to negative tan theta. You are asked in part A to write down the domain of g of theta. Then part B, what is the amplitude of f of theta? And then determine, so this is your graph interpretation section, Part C, where you're asked to determine for which values of theta, and they give you various scenarios. Uh, for example, the part one, where is f of theta equal to naught equal to g of theta? So part C of the question just deals with graph interpretation, just reading off the points straight from your graph. And then uh, that is the last part there. So graph interpretation, obviously a very, very important part when of functions as a whole but you will get these when you're dealing with tests and exams and so on. You're not just going to be asked only to draw the function. You need to also be able to work from a given drawing and then interpret from that drawing. Okay, but let's just quickly summarize what we can on the trig functions. We're going to start off with the sine function. The defining equation of that is y is equal to a sine theta plus q. Okay, so if I make a rough drawing of our sine graph, just to remind you guys what it looks like. All right, so that's your sine graph there. The defining equation y is equal to a sine theta plus q. The period of your sine graph is 360 degrees. In other words, it takes 360 degrees to make a complete, a complete wavelength. So to get this uh, sine theta shape, the period is 360 degrees. Your range is going to depend on the values of A and Q. Remember your range, we're talking about your set of 
y values. Domain, your set of x values. When you're talking about the range, it's a set of y values. Where does y start? Where does y end? All right? Then, if you're looking at value of a, how does it affect the amplitude of the graph? Now, remember, whenever you've got a number coefficient in front of your function, that is going to affect the amplitude of the graph. Okay. Now, if a is greater than 1, there is going to be a vertical stretch and your amplitude will increase. Now, how do you work out amplitude, guys? Your amplitude is always just going to be equal to the value of a. All right. So, for example, if in my defining equation a here was 3, my amplitude will be 3. Okay, another way you can work out the amplitude, it's the difference between your highest value and your lowest value. So it's really just the difference in your highest or your maximum point minus your minimum point divided by 2. That's another way that you can work out the amplitude of the graph. But if you are given the equation, it's actually really easy to read it off because A is just equal to uh, your, sorry, your amplitude is equal to A. All right. Um, now, if A is a fractional number, a positive fraction between 0 and 1, then your amplitude will decrease. If you're looking at values of A that are negative, not only it's going to do something, it's going to do quite a few things. Hey, there's going to be a reflection about the x-axis. Then we've now got to subdivide that because you can get negative numbers that are fractions, so between minus 1 and 0. Then you're going to get your amplitude decreasing and there will be a reflection about the x-axis. If, however, A is less than negative 1, then the amplitude increases and there is a reflection about the x-axis. Obviously, whenever you're dealing with A being a negative number, what we're saying here is you're definitely going to get a reflection on the x-axis. Then, depending on whether A is a negative fraction between 0 and 1, or if A is less than negative 1, you're going to get different things. Okay, so if you have a fractional value, negative fractional value, not only will it reflect, you're also going to get the graph decreasing, the amplitude decreasing. Okay. Uh, if we change the values of Q, just like we did with every other function thus far, the value of Q implies a vertical shift. So it's going to move the graph vertically up or down. All right. Now, the cos function, all of the points that I've just mentioned for the sine function are still relevant for your cos graph. Okay. A reminder of what the cos graph looks like. All right, with the highest point of 1 and a minimum point of minus 1. All right. Let's go through it step by step as we did with the sine graph. The period, how long does one wavelength of a cosine function take? Well, it's 360 degrees. The range, again, will, determine, will be dependent on the values of A and Q. The value of A affects the amplitude of the graph. And guys, I'm not going to go through every single point because these points are exactly the same for the sine graph. Okay, so the value of A will de determine the amplitude of the graph. And depending on whether A, a is greater than 1, a fraction between 0 and 1, less than 0 and so on, you're going to get the different effects on the graph. All right. Again, once again, changing the values of Q is going to imply a vertical movement up or down the axis. And then lastly, you learned the tangent function. You're defining equation. Y is equal to A tan theta plus Q. Big difference here between the other two. Your period is 180 degrees. Now, what that means is it's going to take 180 degrees to get a complete tan function, all right? You'll also remember with the tan graph, you have asymptotes at 0 and 90, all right? Remember your asymptotes? The graph does not touch the asymptotes. It's undefined at the asymptotes. So x is not equal to 90, x is not equal to 70. Now, if you're thinking about a reason why this would be, all right? Now, 
think about if you're doing, we, do, we looked at trig before and we looked at the special angles. So we looked at 90 and we looked at 45 and all of those special angles. If you look at tan of 90, what's happening there? Your definition of tan of theta is y over x. At the value 90 degrees, right, your x value is actually zero. Now remember, if you take anything and divide by zero, it's going to be undefined, does not exist. Therefore, you'll find the tangent function does not exist at x is equal to 90 and x is equal to 270, because in other words, what you're doing at that point is you're dividing by zero, which is undefined. Okay, so that's just the reasoning behind. If you are wondering why is it, why do we get the asymptotes? Well, that's the reason. Your x value at those, val at those lines is zero. All right, your range for your uh, tan graph, y is an element of reals, because remember the graph continues infinitely in the positive direction and infinitely in the negative direction. The value of A will affect the steepness of each of the branches. So here when we're talking about branches, I'm talking about these little twists here, these little curves, right? So the value of A will affect the steepness of those branches, that's what I mean by the branches. Um, the greater the value of A, the faster the branch will approach the asymptote. Remember, it will never actually touch the asymptote, it just reaches it quicker. Okay? Change in values of Q, like exactly the same as all the other graphs, it's going to imply a vertical movement up or down the the axes, okay, so vertical movement upwards on your y-axis, okay. All right, guys, so that's just a quick summary of all the graphs you've done so far. Um, I think we should maybe take a break before we go straight into our questions for today, Abby. Yes, sure, but let's um, acknowledge our minds that are watching and chatting to me on the page. Andy LeBridget, uh, welcome, saying I'm in, and Tepi Sototete saying let the learning begin, and Michi also saying I'm really enjoying this show so far, so good. Thank you so much, Michi Khotato. Really appreciate it, guys. We'll see you after the break. The challenge question is posted already on facebook.com forward slash learnextra. Welcome back, Mindsetters. Now, to the Mindsetters that are still looking for the notes, go to learn.mindset.co.za. Otherwise, they are posted already on the, the wall. Just a quick tip, Mindsetters, to help you. If you've seen the notes link on Facebook, all you can do, you can just share that on your wall and, that, and then know that whenever you need your notes, you can just go to your wall on Facebook and still get them at any time. And you can share with your friends, your classmates, and everyone. Like the Mindsetter was... Um, who just wrote to me on Facebook, Jan Kim Muketsana, saying, I'm paying attention because I'm writing tomorrow. So this could also help you in case you lose them, but you'll know that you always have them on your wall. So all the best for tomorrow. Great. All right, guys. So we're carrying on with trig graphs, and now we're looking at some of the questions. Question one says, draw a sketch graph of y is equal to tan x plus 1 for x an element from 0 to 180. So what have they given you here? They've given you the domain 0 to 180. Please do not confuse this. Domain is not the same as period. Okay? Remember, the domain is just the range over which you're sketching the graph. So it's the set of x values for which you're sketching the graph. The period is how long it takes to make that specific graph or that specific function, trig function. All right. Now, I've just drawn up an axis here. Remember, with your tan graph, you're going to be working in intervals of 45. So I've put down the rough points that we're going to need. You also will need to show on your graph where 45 and 1 is. Where is it going to touch your graph? All right. So I'm going to just quickly fill in other things on our axes. We've got 45, 90, 180. We've also got a value of 1 there, and let's put a minus 1 down here. Okay, so those are points that I want to include in my graph. Now, guys, we're looking at a vertical shift here. We've got tan of x plus 1. Okay, so that's a vertical shift of tan x up one unit in the positive direction. Okay, so what we're going to do is draw the normal tan x graph and simply move it up 
one unit. Okay, because remember, when you're saying tan x plus 1, all of your function values, all of your y values, are really, you're just taking it and you're adding 1. So it's literally just shifting up by 1 unit. So the distance between the original tan x function and tan x plus 1 is going to be 1. All right, important things on the tan graph. We first need to write down our asymptotes. Okay, and if you were paying attention from the previous summary, you'll see that x is equal to 90 is an asymptote, and x is equal to, seven to 270. However, guys, we are only sketching over the domain 0 to 180. So that means this one is going to be outside of the domain that we're looking at. So therefore, we don't have to put that specific asymptote in because it's not going to be on our graph. It's not going to be for the specific period, uh, uh, specific domain. So therefore, x is equal to 90 is the only asymptote that we are interested in. All right, and we know that at x is equal to 90, the graph is undefined. So at 90 degrees, okay, which is there, I'm just going to move that down, going straight through 90, we're going to have our asymptote. Okay, and then if this graph went on, if they asked us to sketch it from 0 to 360, there obviously would have been the other one at 270, but we're not interested in that portion of the graph. So our graph is really just going to stop at 180, so we don't need this continuation of the axis. Hey, it's just going to stop at 180 degrees, which is going to be, there we go, somewhere there. All right. So you only draw, guys, if they give you a specific domain, you're only going to be interested in that part of the graph. You're not going to draw all this extra stuff from 180 to 360. We're only interested in this little portion, okay? So that's our y-axis, that's the x-axis. We know that that's the origin, that's the point naught naught. all right? Remember, an important point on your normal trig graph is tan of 45 is equal to 1. This point, this coordinate, you need to show on your sketch graph. Remember, it's a sketch graph, so you're not doing point by point plotting. You're putting in the key or vital information. 1 and 45 is one of the things you need to show on your tan graph. So tan, when, tan, when x is 45, tan of 45 is 1. So that means when we draw the normal graph, remember I'm not drawing tan x plus 1 yet. I'm just drawing tan x, and we're going to move that. All right, so that's the first little section there. And then we know that it cuts the y-axis at 180 and naught. Again, and it's going to come approaching your asymptotes at x is equal to 90, never really meeting that asymptote, right? So therefore, we've got our key points. We know that at naught, the graph is naught. At 45 degrees, your values there are 45 and 1. At 180, it's 180 and naught. And then if you wanted to put one more key point in at 135, the graph is minus 1. Okay, so that's your original graph. Now, we're going to take that graph, right, and we're going to move it upwards vertically to get this graph. So this is my original graph, this graph in pink. All right. All I'm going to do with my vertical shift is I'm going to move the original pink graph up one unit. So let's see if we can just clone this graph here. Okay. All right, so that's your original graph. You can see they're on top of each other, right? I'm going to simply move that graph up one unit. So, guys, it's no longer going to start at naught naught. Now, where is it going to start? It's going to start at 1 and naught because we're moving it up one unit. Okay, and I want to try and show you as far as possible so that it doesn't look like those two are intersecting. But we're going to move the graph up one unit so that the distance between the two graphs, that distance there, needs to be one. 
Okay, my graph is not drawn accurately in two scale and so on. So therefore, you can't really see nicely, but that distance there has to be one. They mustn't intersect. Okay, the difference between those two graphs needs to be one. So you simply take your first graph and you move it up one unit. I'm saying the same thing over and over again so that it sinks in and that you guys understand, right? Again, let's do the same thing. So we clone the first pink graph. Okay, that's it, sitting on top of each other. What are we doing? We're moving that graph up one unit. So instead of it being 180 and naught, it's now going to be 180. We add one to naught and we get one. So therefore, your graph again is moving up one unit. Okay, I'm trying to keep this as steady as possible so the graphs don't intersect and I hope we don't lose any accuracy in it. There we go. So therefore, the distance between the two at the bottom, remember this is still part of the same tan x function, that distance should be one unit if you move it accurately. Now remember, this is what I'm saying to you. If you look at your end points, and I'm going to go over the tan x plus 1 in yellow so that you can see what's happening clearly. Okay, so the graph's in yellow. That is our tan x plus 1. And all we've done is we've simply taken the original function and moved it up one unit. And that's how you expect it to draw these graphs um, in school in the grade 10 level. You're not going to do point by point values and use a table and that. You need to know your key values and then use that original tan graph or your original cos sine graph and then either move it or stretch it or shrink it or whatever the case is. All right. All right. And then remember, guys, you need to show those key points. So I've shown you on the pink graph, 45 and 1 was the original point. But on your new graph, you also need to show that key point is now going to be no longer 45 and 1. It's going to be 45 and two. Okay, so that's a key point on your new tan function. Okay, similarly at 180, it's no longer 180 and zero, it's moved up to 180 and one. Okay, all right. Hopefully you're all with me, you all understand that. Key points for you to remember on the tan graph, remember to get your asymptotes, remember to put in your value at 45, at uh, 90, you need to put your asymptotes. At 180, you need to have your x-intercept. And at 0, you need to have your x-intercept. And at 135, you can put in the point minus 1. So those are the key points you need to draw the tan function. Please don't put in every single value. It's going to take forever. It's going to take way too long for what this question will be worth. All right. Okay. Let's move on. So this is question 2. Okay, this one's slightly longer. Here we asked to sketch the graphs of f of x is equal to 2 sine x and g of x is equal to cos x minus 1. They're on the same system of axes, so we need to be a little bit careful here. Um, x is an element from 0 to 360, so that is our domain, not the period. Okay, so let's put in some values, some key points that we will be putting on the sine graph and the cos graph, okay? We know the value naught, naught, that's at your origin, so that's naught, naught, where the axes intersect. And then um, we've got the values for 90. We know that sine of 90 is 1, so if I just label these, I'm going to use each of these as 30, so that's 30, 60, 90. So we'll say that's 90 there. Okay, and then that's going to be 120. 150, and then this will be 180. All right. Uh, 180, we're going up in sets of 30. 180 plus 30, that's going to give me 210, 240, 270 at that little square there. 270, 300, 330, so that will be 360 there, which means I can reduce my axis just to what we are interested in. Okay. All right, well, we, it's completely locked. Let's unlock it and hope for the best that it doesn't move everything. Okay, the whole thing is moving as one unit. So let's scrap that idea. Leave it as it is, but know that we're not going to be interested in anything beyond the point 360 degrees. All right, so we're stopping at 
360, which is this little dot there. Okay, so that's the portion of the axis that we're interested in. Um, on our y-axis, we know that we can see that the sine graph is going to go up to the point 2. So we're going to say that that is going to be 1. And so 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, and that's going to be the point 2. Similar thing going down. 1, that's going to be minus 1 and minus 2. Okay, so we have an idea of what our axis is going to look like. Okay, for the 2 sine x graph, okay, you're simply taking all of your key points on your sine graph and you're timesing them by 2. So your function values are being multiplied by 2. Remember what I told you before. A is greater than 1, therefore your amplitude is going to increase. It's going to stretch the graph. All right? Your key points on your sine graph, we know that at naught, it's naught. All right? At 90, your normal sine graph is 1. Okay, we know that it cuts the x-axis again at 180. And then the minimum points at, the, uh, at 270 is minus 1. I'm trying to keep that in line going across. And then at 360, the graph comes back up to naught. So we've got x-intercepts um, here of at naught and naught, and then at 180 and naught, and then we've got at 360 and naught. All right, so my original sine graph is going to look like that. All right, now if you're taking that graph and you are then timesing each and every value by 2, guys, what's going to happen? Those key values are going to stretch out, right? So 0 times 2 is going to give me 0. That other point, the, main, the starting point, your first intercept, 0, 0, from 0 to 360 is going to stay at the same point. Instead of plotting 90 and 1, we times that by 2. Sine of 90 is 1 times by 2, so at 90 degrees, we're now plotting 2 units. Okay? 270, we know that the, a, uh, the y, value, uh, y value is minus 1, but we're going to times that by 2. So we're going to get a point at 270 and minus 2. All right, and then 360, 0 times 2 is going to stay as 0. All right, so therefore my new graph is going to be a stretched version of the original graph. Okay, so the graph in green is the one I'm interested in, and you can see that vertical stretch between the blue graph and the green graph. All your, your amplitude has changed, your graph has been stretched out. Okay, and I'm just going to delete the blue graph because we really don't need that blue graph. Okay, let's cut that out. There we go. All right, so we're just interested in the graph in green. And take out those points there and let's neaten it up just a little bit there. And then here again. Okay, so that's the sine, uh, 2 sine x graph. So this is y is equal to 2 sine x. That's that first one that they've asked you to sketch, which we call in green, that's f of x. Okay, then we've got g of x is equal to cos x minus 1. So what are we doing there? We're taking the original cos graph and we're moving it down one unit. Okay, so your normal cos graph, what does it look like? We know that it starts at the point naught 1. All right? What else do we have? So we have cos of naught is equal to 1. Cos of 90 is naught. Cos of 180 minus 1. Nothing's happening to the amplitude here. There's no multiplication sign. There's no coefficient, sorry, in front of the cos. So therefore, it's going to stay at exactly the same function values. We've got cos of 270 is naught, and then cos of 360 goes back up to 1. So I'm going to draw the original cos function and then move that. What do they ask you to do? Move it down one unit. So it's a vertical shift downwards. So that's our original cos function. And guys, we simply now, in order to sketch 
cos x minus 1, we're simply going to take that graph and minus 1 from all the points. So if I take this graph, I move it down one unit. So it's simply going to do that. Okay, just a little bit more. So there we go, touches the axes. There we go. So that's your cos graph, which has been moved down one unit. So this is the graph G of X. All right. All right, so just to go over that again, reiterate, reiterate, reiterate. That's what we've got to do so that you guys remember those important points. You simply take your original functions. In this case, we took the 2 sine x graph times the original function by 2 to give us our graph in green, which is now f of x. For g of x, which is cos x minus 1, we took the cos x graph, which is now in pink, and we subtracted 1 to show the vertical movement downwards. We're now ready to answer the questions on this graph, on these two graphs that we've sketched, okay? All right. Firstly, they say use your graph to determine f of 180 degrees. They're asking you here, what is the function value? So what is the y value when x is equal to 180 degrees? What is the y value on your sine graph? We simply read it off the graph, guys. We go to 180 degrees, and we see, and I'm just going to use a different color so we don't mix up causes and signs here. We see that f of 180 degrees is simply naught. That's just reading straight from the graph. Okay? Next question, find g of 180. So again, what is the y value on your cos graph, when the x value is 180, we go to 180 degrees, we go down, have a look at where that function is reaching, and we see that at 180, my cos graph is at the point minus 2. Okay, so that's just reading straight from the graph, and that's why it's important to always have an accurate picture. You will get graph paper in exams, and you'll be able to do it exactly to scale and accurately. All right, we've got g of 270 minus f of 270 as part c. So we're going to look at g being the, what is g? g is the cos graph. So what's the difference? What's the vertical distance between the two graphs at 270 degrees? Okay, so we look at the cos graph at 270. And we see that the value there is minus 1. And then if we go across, so I'm reading across from the, x, from the y axis, right? So at 270, my cos graph is minus 1. And at 270, the sine graph is at minus 2. So if I'm going to say, well, what is the difference between the two? I'm simply going to say top graph minus bottom graph. So in other words, the y value on the cos graph minus the y value on the sine graph minus 1 plus 2 is just going to give me 1. All right? Then we are asked for the range of g. Remember the range being the set of y values. So we start by saying y is an element from something to something. Right? Let's go and have a look at the graph. So we're talking here about your cos graph. The lowest point, your minimum point on your cos graph is minus 2, and the maximum point is naught. So therefore, your range goes, your set of y values will start at minus 2 and end at naught. It does not go beyond that point. So it's going to be from minus 2 to naught. Okay. And then finally, the amplitude and the period of f of x. Now your amplitude, remember what I told you in your summary, your amplitude reading straight from the question they gave you, your amplitude is simply going to be the value of a, so therefore your amplitude is going to be 2. So your amplitude is going to be equal to 2. The period, how long do you, does it take to make a sine graph? What is the, the period or the time frame required in degrees to get one wavelength off your sine graph? The period is 360 degrees. Okay, because you can see our complete sine curve, we get a complete graph between 0 and 360 degrees, so therefore the period of the graph is 360 degrees. All right. 
So guys, a lot to take in, a lot of information coming your way. I hope that you understand all of that. Graph interpretation, you need to practice, 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 and then it will get better. AB, over to you. Thank you. You practice and ask if you don't understand. And already, uh, Natasha, there's some questions on Facebook, which we're going to deal with them later on. A quick reminder about the More Maths app. You go to moremaths.org, and your key code as grade 10s is 2FB5. After the break, I'll be announcing the winner of this awesome Casio calculator. Welcome back, my sisters. If you just joined us now, you're a bit late, but I'm sure Natasha is taking us very, very slow. You'll understand and still catch up. But now the moment that we've all been waiting for to hear the winner of our last week's show for this awesome case, your calculator. And our winner is Pilani Sibia. Congratulations to you, Pilani Sibia. We'll be in contact uh, of you and make sure that you get this awesome case, your calculator. Back to you, Natasha. All right, guys, so carrying on with graph interpretation, we are moving on to the challenge question. And graph interpretation, I know it can be daunting sometimes, but you guys just need to keep on it, keep asking us questions, and just keep on practicing more and more and more questions. All right, so carrying on with the practice, here we've got a diagram showing the graphs of f of theta is equal to 3 sine theta. That's obviously your sine graph in white. And then I've just gone over g of theta, which is negative tan theta. I've just outlined that in orange. All right. First question. Now, let's just, before we move on to the questions, let's analyze what's happened here, right? They've sketched the graph from 0 to 360, so that's our domain. We can see that we have asymptotes that x is equal to 90 and x is equal to 270 for the tan graph, obviously the graph approaches those asymptotes but never really touches those asymptotes, okay? We can see that the graph, if we're looking at the tan graph, it's negative tan theta, so that's the reflection on the x-axis. And then for 3 sine theta, remember if there's a number in front, A here is greater than 1, it's going to affect your amplitude. And in this case, it causes the graph to be stretched out. So the maximum point being 3 and then your minimum being minus 3. All right. Okay, so let's have a look at the first question. They ask us to write down the domain of G of theta. So your domain, remember, is your set of X values. Now, guys, they've given you the domain because they've sketched the graph from 0 to 360. So therefore... Write down the domain of g of theta. g, we're talking about your tan graph, all right? Now, this is where you've got to be careful. Don't get tricked up here because we've sketched the graph from 0 to 360. So, therefore, the domain, your set of x values, is going to start at 0 and go to 360. Don't confuse that with your period. So don't think that because the period of the tan graph is 180 degrees, the domain is going to be the same. Remember, it doesn't work like that. A period and a domain, completely separate things. Okay, your period is how long it takes to make that specific curve, and your domain is your set of x values for which you have drawn that graph. All right, so the domain for the tan graph is going to be x an element from naught to 360. That's just where we've sketched the graph. We started at 0 and we ended at 360. Okay? Then they say, what is the amplitude of f of theta? So remember, your amplitude I've shown you before, your amplitude is simply the value, the a in front of your function, whatever it might be, sine, cos, tan. So therefore here, our amplitude is going to be 3. All right? Another way for you to work out the amplitude, so this is an alternate, okay? So I'm going to just skip to the bottom of the page and show you part B here. Okay, your amplitude, you can also work out by saying the maximum point on the graph minus the minimum divided by 2. So if we do that now, take that into consideration with our sine graph, the maximum value is 3, the minimum value is minus 3. So I'd say 3 minus, in brackets, minus 3, all divided by 2. So I get 3 minus minus 3, which gives me 6, 
over 2, which is equal to 3. All right, so you can work out your amplitude the long way by doing that maximum minus minimum divided by 2, or you can simply look at the graph they've given you, and your amplitude is the value in front of your trig function. Okay. More graph interpretation, part C, determine for which values of theta f of theta is equal to naught and is equal to g of theta. So what they're telling you is that the graph of f and the graph of g, at which point do they share the same value of naught? Okay? So for which values of theta, remember theta being in degrees, will f of theta be equal to g of theta and then they both have the same value of naught? So again, we look at the graph. And we're looking at the points where they're equal to each other and they're equal to zero. So that happens here at the point naught, naught. Obviously, your y value is going to be naught because we're looking for where the y values are equal to naught. Again, there and at that point. Okay? So at naught on the x axis, your y value is in fact naught. At 180 degrees on the x axis, the y value on both your graphs, your sine graph and your tan graph, is equal to naught. And then at 360, again, both your tan function and your sine function share the same value. So therefore, there's three answers here. Theta is equal to naught. Um, I think it was 180. Yep, 180 and 360. Okay, so there's three parts, three points at which they share the same y value of naught. Okay, part two, where is g of theta times f of theta less than naught? So if you analyze that, right, they're looking for where the product of the two function values is negative. Now think about that just in terms of just your normal number lines, okay? You're looking for where the product of two y values is going to be negative. That can only happen when there are different signs. So when the one is positive and the other is negative, because a positive times a negative is a negative. All right, so that's what you're looking at. You're looking for where the one graph is above the axis, and in that same time, the other graph is below the x-axis. Because remember, all your y values above the x-axis are positive, and all your y values below the x-axis are negative. So if you times them together you're going to get a negative answer, a less than naught. So they say, where is the product of the two graphs negative? So we analyze this. This happens in certain intervals, right? Okay. So if we look at from naught to 90 degrees, obviously tan graph undefined at 90, so we can't include that endpoint, right? Between naught and 90, if you look at your sine graph, all your y values here are positive. It all lies above the x-axis, okay? And then if you look at the y values on your tan graph, all of them, all your y values here are negative because all those points lie below the x-axis. So therefore, in the interval from 0 to 90, the product of the two graphs, so g of theta times f of theta is going to be less than 0 in that interval from 0 to 90 because... The one graph's above the axis, the other one's below the axis, right? So one of our intervals there, we'll see if there's more, but this is part two, the one interval. Theta is an element. We just want less than naught. We don't want equal to naught. So theta is an element from naught to 90 degrees. Okay? Let's go on and see if there's any other part that that happens. If we now move on from 90 to 180, we see that both the graphs are above the x-axis in that interval. They're both above the axis, so both having positive y values. If you times it together, your answer is going to be positive. Then if you look from 180 to 270, same thing happens, right? They're both below the x-axis, so therefore, if you look at the two graphs in that interval from 90 to 270. They're either both above or both below the x-axis at the same point in time. So that's not going to be one of your intervals where you're going to get the product being negative. All right? Then if we go from 270 
to 360 degrees, we see here the sine function below the x-axis, so therefore you've got negative y values, and then the cos function is above the x-axis, so you've got positive y values, positive times negative is a negative, so therefore my other interval where the product of the two graphs is going to be negative is from 270 to 360 degrees. So thetas, so union theta is an element from 270 to 360 degrees. All right, and that's a round bracket. Okay. Now it's almost the same thing. Now you're just dividing it. They're saying, where's the tan graph divided by the sine graph? Now greater than naught. And guys, we've sort of already answered this because when we looked at each interval, I went over where the graph was positive, where the graph was negative, and so on and so on. So we know that it's negative. The product of the two graphs is negative from 0 to 90 and from 270 to 360. But I showed you in the interval from 90 to 270, they either both graphs lay above the x-axis or both graphs lay below the x-axis. Therefore, in the interval from 90 to 270, whether you're dividing or multiplying the rules the same, if I divide one graph by the other, my answer is going to be positive. So it's going to be from 90 to 70, to 270. Okay, and we want it to be greater than 0. So theta is an element, and we've got to be careful here. It's from 90 to 270. But guys, look at what happens. Because remember, between 90 and 270, we have the point 180. Okay? And at the point 180... Both graphs are zero. So you can't include 180 degrees in that interval because you're going to get an undefined number. And we're dividing here. We're saying g of theta divided by f of theta. So we've got to exclude that point from that specific interval, right? So we can write it as theta is an element from 90 to 270, theta not equal to 180 degrees. Okay. Alternatively, you can split the interval up and you can say, so this is part three. So you can also say it as theta is an element from 90 to 180, right? And theta is an element, sorry, we'll do it down here. Theta is an element from 180 to 270. So in this way, we can exclude the value of 180 degrees. Okay, so either way is going to be acceptable. If you're going to do the entire interval, just remember to exclude the point 180 degrees. Okay, last part, part four. Where is f of theta an increasing function? Now, for so many colors on this graph, it's going to be tricky to try and isolate <laughs> what we're talking about here. So f of theta is our sine graph. We want to know where it's increasing. Firstly, we need to understand what increasing means, because obviously if we don't know what increasing means, we can't answer the question. Remember, an increasing function, your, as your x values increase, your function values or your y values increase at the same time. So we're looking for where the graph, as the x values are increasing, your y values are increasing. We're talking about the sine graph. And we see that that happens on the interval. From 0 to 90, we can see that as the x values go up, the y values also go up. But then if we go from 90 to 270, that entire piece of that function is decreasing between 90 and 270. As x increases, y decreases. And then from 270 to 360, we once again have the graph increasing. So therefore, for part 4, where is the graph increasing? Well, theta is an element from 0 to 90, and theta is an element from 270 to 360, and that's where we get the increasing portions of the graph of f. All right. Okay, so again, quite a lot to take in. Graph interpretation sometimes seems overwhelming, but really all you've got to do, break it down, practice, 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 and ask, ask, ask. 
All right, let me give mm -hmm. you some questions, uh, Natasha, All because right. you're out of time. Uh, there's okay. one from Abu uh, here saying, I still don't understand the graph in question two. How did the graph increase? Okay, so here in question two, they're obviously talking about the sine graph, two sine x. All we did, guys, is we simply took the original sine function, sine of x, and we times all the values by 2. So we found all the key points on the sine graph and we multiplied by 2. So for example, we knew sine of 90 was 1, times that by 2 and that gives us the new point 90 at, at 90 degrees your sine graph is 2. So we simply took all of those key values and times them by 2 to show us the increase in the sine function. Thank you so All much, right. Natasha. Unfortunately, we're out of time, but here's a oh. comment from <laughs> Angela saying, thank you so much, mind Mindset. I really appreciate what you guys are doing. Wow. Wow to Abram and, Nat and Natasha. You are, you are awesome, guys. God bless you. I love you. Thank you, Andy Le Budget. We love you, too. Oh, Bridget, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Natasha. Thank Up you, until Abby. next time. Thank you for being here with us as well. And guys, I'll see you next week. Awesome. We love you guys and keep up well. Peace. All the best for tomorrow.